So that brings us to this. Mike's list of three questions. To determine if an elimination or substitution reaction is going to be E1, E2, SN1, or SN2. Question number one. Is the carbon bonded to my leaving group primary, secondary, or tertiary? If it's primary, then the reaction can only be SN2 or E2. Why? The reason is because you'll remember that in E1 and SN1 reactions, the leaving group takes off first, giving me a carbocation. Will that ever occur with a primary carbon? Am I ever going to get a primary carbocation? No, they're way too unstable. So once again, if it's primary, it can only possibly be SN2 or E2. Now if it's tertiary, it can't be an SN2. Now don't worry, I'll explain later on why. Thus, if it's tertiary, it can only be SN1, E1, or E2. Now if it's secondary, or if it's a stabilized carbon, such as one in an allyl or a benzyl position, then it could be any of the above. All of this is summarized in this little figure I made myself. Leaving group stuck to primary carbon, SN2 or E2, done. If it's stuck to tertiary, it can only be SN1, E1, or E2. And if it's any of these, then it could be any of the above. Now if you're in any of these ambiguous circumstances, you might wonder, what in the world am I supposed to do? The answer is, go to the next question. Number two, is my nucleophile slash base strong or weak? Now remember from our previous discussions, strong nucleophiles slash bases have negative charges. Now there are some exceptions to this. Negative charges that are on halogens or negative charges that are resonance stabilized are weak. If your nucleophile slash base is strong, then your reaction will be a 2, either SN2 or E2. If it's weak, then it will be a 1, either SN1 or E1. Remember, localized negative charge not on a halogen, strong. Negative charge on halogens or resonance delocalized negative charge or no negative charge at all will be weak. Here are some examples of some strong nucleophile slash bases. Keep in mind that the letter M here represents a group 1 metal from the periodic table, either lithium, sodium, or potassium. Anytime you see one of those, you can essentially erase it and replace it with a negative charge. I got one of those attached to a carbon, attached to an oxygen that can't resonance to localize attached to a sulfur, a nitrogen, or another carbon that can't resonance to localize. These are all strong, reactive, and powerful nucleophiles or bases. Here are some examples of some weak nucleophiles slash bases. I've got a resonance to localize negative charge, such as a carbonate, or I've got an alcohol, or water, or a thiol, or an amine. Examples where all I've got are lone pair electrons to act as bases. I don't have a localized negative charge at all. I only have a partial negative charge due to polarity. Or if I've got negatively charged halides, like iodide, bromide, or chloride. These are all weak nucleophile slash bases that will participate in SN1, E1 reactions. Now I realize in asking this question, question number two, we still aren't completely done. There still is some ambiguity. So you might wonder, what do I do next? Well, if you're in a scenario where you still haven't figured out what it is by the time you're done with question two, you go on to question number three, which says, is my nucleophile slash base a nucleophile or a base? Now notice, in questions one or two, I haven't had to make the distinction yet as to which of these two it is. We don't do that until we get to question number three. Let me explain. In substitution and elimination reactions, a nucleophile is something that does substitution, while a base is something that does elimination. The letter S in SN1 and SN2 stands for substitution, and the letters N stand for nucleophilic. Thus, a nucleophile in a substitution elimination scenario is something that will prefer to do substitution, while a base will prefer to do elimination. So how in the world do we make the distinction between a nucleophile or a base? The answer is size. Larger nucleophile slash bases tend to behave more as bases, that is they tend to favor elimination, because they can't fit as easily into the carbon bonded to the leaving group to do a substitution. They therefore prefer to tear hydrogen off from next door to do an elimination. Now in contrast, smaller nucleophile slash bases tend to behave more as nucleophiles favoring substitution because they can fit more easily into the carbon bonded to the leaving group to do a substitution. 
Now let me show you that right here. Once again, in an S and 2 scenario, I've got my molecule, in this case a secondary carbon stuck to bromine, and my strong nucleophile comes in to that position and kicks off my bromide in one fell swoop. Ba bam giving me my product, which has an inverted stereochemistry relative to the stereochemistry at this stereocenter in the starting material. Now note, I've got my strong nucleophile slash base. In order to do a substitution, SN2, it has to come into this carbon and kick off the bromide. In order to fit into this carbon hole, it's much easier to do that if you're small. That's why I'm telling you, small nucleophile slash bases tend to favor substitution more than large, bulky nucleophile slash bases. Now I have to point out something here. This is the reason why SN2s cannot occur on tertiary carbons. If I've got a carbon here that is stuck to three carbons, so it's tertiary, it's impossible for a nucleophile to get into that whole SN2 style, no matter how small that nucleophile is. Even if I've got a tiny nucleophile, if it's trying to attack a tertiary carbon, it will not do a substitution. It will just do an E2 elimination. Let's compare that to our E2 scenario. In an E2, I've got my strong nucleophile slash base that rather than coming into the carbon bond of the leaving group, grabs a hydrogen off the carbon next door, pumps the electrons down, and kicks off the bromide in one fell swoop to give us our two alkene products, with the trans product being favored. Now, I got to tell you. If my base is big, it's much more difficult for it to come in, fit into this hole, and do a substitution. Hence, it will favor just grabbing a hydrogen off of next door and doing an elimination. What's the point? Smaller base slash nucleophiles tend to be more nucleophiles and tend to favor substitution, whereas larger base slash nucleophiles tend to be larger and favor elimination. Same thing applies for SN1 versus E1 scenarios. In an SN1, my starting material floats around until the leaving group takes off, giving my carbocation intermediate. If I've got a nucleophile slash base that, of course, does not have a strong localized negative charge, if that nucleophile slash base is small, it's going to be much easier for it to fit into that hole, thereby doing substitution. Now, in contrast, in an E1 scenario, I've got the same molecule. Leaving group takes off, gives me my carbocation intermediate. Imagine my weak base slash nucleophile is large in size. It's a lot harder to fit into a positively charged carbocation hole if you're a big, bulky base. Thus, larger bases will favor elimination, grabbing the hydrogen next door, pumping the electrons down to give me my two products, with the trans one being favored, of course. So yes, base slash nucleophile size does matter. Smaller nucleophile slash bases will favor substitution, while larger ones will favor elimination, all because of the difficulty of getting in to a small carbocation hole. So you might ask then, where do I draw the line regarding size? For my class and the students who take my class, any nucleophile slash base that looks larger than ethanol, whose structure is shown here, when you draw it on paper, is a base and will do an E reaction. Anything that's equal to or smaller than ethanol on paper is a nucleophile and will do an S or substitution reaction. That is where I draw the line for my students. I want you to remember, of course, that for many of these nucleophile slash bases, in reality, you can get some substitution and some elimination occurring competitively. I have, of course, some exceptions. Although acetate, which has this structure right here, might look larger than ethanol on paper, it is a nucleophile and will do S reactions. Also, negatively charged carbon and sulfur atoms are almost always going to act as nucleophiles regardless of size. So these are the nuances I want you to remember. Back to our lineup. Nucleophiles that are smaller than ethanol on paper are things like this. They will favor substitution reactions, either SN2 or SN1, depending on whether or not they're strong or weak. Bases, in contrast, are molecules that look on paper larger than ethanol. They will favor eliminations.